Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. So we have a special episode for you this week. As we go forward, we're going to start bringing in not only uh, guests and interviews, but we're going to be starting to do prepared episodes where we're just sharing our ideas with you. And in particular, we're going to actually also share things from our seminars. So this is actually a lecture that I gave on the first day of Return to the Source this year. And the topic is why we engage in movement practice what kind of movement practices we can engage in, what the benefits of those practices are, and how we might build up that movement practice, how all these things connect towards really building a more meaningful life through movement practice. So I think you guys are gonna really enjoy this. It's really at the heart of the philosophy of Evolve Move Play. Love your, your comments, your questions, and any support you guys can give. Thank you. It's really important to ask why and to recognize that there is something that motivates us. This is something that really bothers me is like when people are like, Move just because. It's like, well, why, why, why this movement? Why not that movement? You have to have something that you're aimed at. Um, and, and so we, I think fundamentally what we're aimed at is doing something that feels meaningful to us. That's the most, that's the most important thing that you could be aimed at. And there's a reason why we really particularly need that right now. Right? We, why we're craving that right now. Um, my, one of my mentors and friends, John Verveke, talks about the idea that we're in a crisis of meaning. And that this crisis of meaning is in some sense uh, like maybe the overarching problem in a, in a meta crisis that we have, a, a set of crises, a climate crisis, a political crisis, you know, a health crisis. And like we live with a, a really weird paradox and I've been thinking about this for at least six years. Um, 2012 I was talking about this. We live in the safest time in human history. Like, it's very easy to, to sort of bash on Western culture and, you know, talk about how terrible it is, but recognize, like, you can live in Toronto and not die in the winter, right? Electricity is pretty amazing, right? Uh, you can live in, uh, in Arizona and not die in the summer. <laughs> Air conditioning is pretty amazing, right? Uh, you, you have running water, you have clean running water, access to that in huge amounts of the world, right? More people have enough food than have ever had enough food in history. More people have too much food. We have a problem of abundance of food, right? We, we have lower rates of violence through most of the developed world, really most of the world than we've ever seen in history, right? I'm a, I'm a big advocate for ancestral health and this idea that we need to recover something from the past. A lot of people who look back at the past, they romanticize it right? because there was great things about it and hunter foragers live deeply meaningful lives. They also live lives that are conditioned by privation and violence. Right? 30% of men in the average hunter forager society will be killed either in warfare or in, uh, <clears throat> or in, or murdered. Right? Most of them kill each other over access to women. Right? It's not so great for the women either. <laughs> um, so we, we live in an incredibly uh, safe time, incredibly affluent time. And yet on the other hand, we have growing senses of alienation, of lack of meaning, of disconnection, depression, anxiety. Depression and anxiety are on the rise. Suicide rates are up. Suicide rates in kids between 10 to 14 year olds, uh, 10 to 14 have gone up like 400% in the last 15 years. So we have also a problem, right? And, and it's, it's, it's a sense of being disconnected from what's meaningful. And the, the, the research on meaning and suicide is particularly interesting because 
a lot of times meaning precedes a, a, la a loss of feeling of meaning precedes depression and then you have suicide. But they found that even without depression, even without feeling sad or, or depressed, just a sense of meaninglessness can motivate suicide. So, um, so we need meaning and we, we're going to get, uh, this is going to be interesting to try to make this connection, but I think we get meaning through connecting to things, through a sense of deep connection. But what, what we, what, the problem that we have is that we, we've sort of been able to articulate out all these different capacities that have allowed us to rapidly increase, change the world that we live in. But as we've done that, it's disconnected to us from what we've traditionally gone to for meaning. Right? Famously, Nietzsche talks about the God, death of God. We, uh, you know, we created science, which has allowed all this affluence. But once we created science, we didn't have this ability to believe as easily in this two worlds model. Since about, I guess, 3,000 years ago, something called the Axial Revolution, we've tended to believe that there's a the higher world and a lower world, a sacred and a profane, right? There's the forms that Plato talks about, and then there's the, the shadows on the wall that we live in. There's heaven and there's earth, right? And, and so we've, 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 we've invested all of our meaning up there. Platonism and Christianity taught us meaning isn't here in our bodies. It's not here in, in the world that we live in. It's in the next world. It's in the higher world of the forms. And then with, uh, you know, with Thomas Aquinas and, uh, and then the Protestant Reformation, all of a sudden we started to separate the world that we existed from that world even more. And then eventually with the scientific revolution, we lost belief in that higher world. Most of us have. And what happens is that the place where we've put all the meaning went away. And now we're left with a profane world that doesn't have a sense of sacredness, doesn't have a sense of connection, sense of deep meaning. So, what does create meaning for people? Flow states create meaning for people. Time in nature creates meaning for people. Deep connection to other people creates meaning for people. So fundamentally, you know, I looked at my, my own practice like seven years ago or something and I had, you know, over the course of 18 months I tore ligaments in both my feet, subluxated my cuboid bone, tore my Achilles tendon, had a back, two back spasms and a panic attack. Um, then I uh, retore my rotator cuff and uh, had a bad high ankle sprain. And I was like, well, I can try to patch myself together with tape for the next three years and keep competing as a parkour athlete, or I can take the time to heal my body. And so then I start thinking about, well, what, what do I want from my practice in the long term? And I was like, well, I want my practice to be something, I, I just really enjoy jumping around and doing things, and it feels really meaningful to me for some reason, and I don't want to lose that. So then I started asking, well, why does it feel meaningful to me? What is it about? Um, so I, there's this saying from mountaineering, it's not what the man does to the mountain, it's what the mountain does, or it's not what the man does to the mountain, it's what the, what the man does, it's, not, it's what the mountain does to the man, right? So we could, we could generalize this. We could say it's not what your movement practice or your practices, it's not what you accomplish within them that matters, it's what they accomplish for you that matters. And once you, you start thinking about your practices that way, it changes the whole way that you frame it. So this is what we've come to with what is Evolve Move Play about? Like what are we trying to give you over the course of this week? We believe that fundamentally your movement practice is a quest for meaning, to do something in your life that gives deep meaning to you. And you can look at that, right, like I'm very influenced by Jordan Peterson, he would describe that as essentially aiming at your most heroic self. A human being has an aim that they need to be sent towards and what could be better than the heroic archetype and being aimed at that. That's one way to look at it. But you don't have to accept that model, you could just say it's fostering your own character. Right? What is the character that you want to develop? Can I be a more courageous person? Cultivate your character. Verveik, he talks about self-transcendence. Um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi Mihalik talks about optimal experience. This is an interesting one for us because optimal experience is something that you could say we derive from having a quest for meaning, but also the flow state 
we know is directly related to a sense of meaning and also directly related to accomplishing all the things that get you to that person that you want to be. So it's kind of like in there, but also all around there, <laughs> surrounds it. Within that, let's say we're on this quest for meaning and we have to have this because we live in a world that is too complex for us. And this is, this is, this is such an interesting problem and, and Verveke has, has, has articulated this so well, but P Peterson Verveke, John Boyd, who's one of my big influences in thinking about movement, N Nikolai Bernstein, J.J. Gibson, all over we this theme that, that th the world is actually too complex for us. So, can you grab three balls? Huh? Sure. So, um, I'm going to go back for a second. We'll get to this, but there's, there's a really nice distinction that, that Verveke made that I really like. You can say that there are two types of problems, right? In life, we have to solve problems. There are two types of problems, central types of problems that you have to deal with. One are what he calls well-defined problems. The other are ill-defined problems. A well-defined problem is like, a, is like 33 times 3 is whatever the number is, right? You, you can have a precise solution to it. Uh, an ill-defined problem is something like, how do Angel and I have a really good conversation? There's no simple solution to that, right? Something like playing a, a successful game of chess is actually a ill-defined problem, right? Because in any one turn in chess, you have something like 30 options available to you, 30 legal moves that you can make, and a game of chess averages 60 moves. So the number of chess, the number of options for you to play out a game of chess is 30 to the 60. That is more than the number of electrons in the universe. So, so this is a problem that's called combinatorial explosion. Once you start combining things, you have combinatorial explosion. So I'll, I'll give you guys a, 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 another relevant one, right? So let's say we're gonna talk to you guys about jumps. We could have a jump from two feet to two feet. We could have jumped from one foot to the other foot. We could have a jump from the same foot to the same foot. We could have a jump from one feet to two feet, and we could have a jump from two feet to one feet. So that's five variations. So now put them together in how many different ways? Now let's say there's five vaults. We could say five vaults, I don't know, 10 vaults. How many different climbs? How many different swings? So now I want you to systematically train all of the relevant skills in parkour in a perfect program. Combinatorial explosion, again, right? And actually when we go right down to the level of how your body controls movement, you have the same problem. You have a set of highly redundant physical features. So if he and I are going to play this game, right? So we're trying to control essentially a set of degrees of freedom. Okay. So as we're juggling these balls, which hand we catch with is one degree of freedom, right? The timing is another degree of freedom. The height of the ball is another degree of freedom, right? The speed, the tempo, very quickly gets out of control. If you look at your, if I'm going to take this ball and bring it to my mouth, let's say it's an apple, um, I have my fingers, so this joint, this joint, this joint, this joint, this joint, I have this joint, I have this joint, and I have this joint that can all contribute to that, right? So you're probably going to do this if you need this, but why not this? Why not this? Why not this, right? Why not this? <laughs> okay. Your, your nervous system somehow is really good at getting rid of all of the irrelevant stuff, right? It's really good at getting rid of, of what's not relevant and finding a stable pathway. But it's actually not very good at finding the optimal pathway because it has to search the entire space for the optimal pathway, which is combinatorially explosive. So what we operate off of is heuristics. So if you can find a precise answer, it's an algorithm. If you have to get a good enough answer, it's a heuristic, okay? Here's the, here's the, 
the difficult part about that. A heuristic is a prejudice. Right? So if we're playing chess, my heuristic is control the center of the board. Right? That's one heuristic. Uh, get my queen out early, castle my king. A really smart chess player, if he knows I'm playing off those heuristics, can hide what he's doing from me and beat me by knowing what I'm doing. Because I've prejudged the situation in a way that he can take advantage of. So the very things that allow us to be adaptive and deal with this combinatorial explosion of the world that we live in also are how we consistently lie to ourselves. It's how we bullshit ourselves. We look at the world around us and we think this is salient, that's not salient, because it, it, it goes back to a narrative that we've created. And every time we have to change that, it's costly to our brains. So. Self-transcendence is basically about setting up ways of making yourself adaptive and able to change and see through your own heuristics and adopt new heuristics. So like what John Boyd talks about is having mental models that you use. Can you think like a game theorist and like an evolutionary biologist and like a mathematician and like a chess player? And that's how you, and you have competing models. And by having those competing models, you're able to get outside of your own dogmas. So that's a little bit about the decrees of freedom problem, about the problem of how we solve with heuristics. And now that brings us to, okay, well, why are you here rolling around in the dirt, poking each other in the head? Um, so we believe that one of the most powerful places that you can go on this heroic quest, that you can set yourself up effectively to solve problems is to study movement because all of our original problem solving happens at the movement level. In fact, thinking, is mostly, is mostly modeling motor actions in the world. This is a great scientific uh, philosopher, uh, I can't, uh, his name is escaping me right now, he said, we think so our thoughts may die and we don't have to. So we've abstracted the Darwinian process into our brain. A mosquito has a thousand babies, almost all of them die, right? You think thousands of thoughts that you're like, no, uh, that'll probably kill, uh, get my wife to kill me, <laughs> right? I'm across, nope, there's a car, right? That ability to inhibit a thing and actually choose a different thing is what makes you a conscious agent. So we think so our thoughts may die and, and we don't have to. Um, so how do we think better? Well, we, we build ourselves in this way. So if we're trying to get to this why, what we found is through our work, people have found their uh, found meaning through these reconnections. This is the themes that people talk about all the time when we ask them, why? People say, return of the source was life-changing. It's like, okay, well, what was, li was life-changing about it? They're like, man, the people that I met changed my life. I've never felt so connected to people. It's like, oh, being in these beautiful places was something else. I feel totally different about how I feel about my body. I never meant movement could I never knew movement could mean something like this. I, I haven't played like that since I was a child, right? It was, it was fun, it was deeply motivational. So what we sort of see as is happening is, so let's, starting here at motivation, our system of education, our economic system, which has great benefits in certain ways, I'm not trying to just drag it down, but it's just pointing out where, where we've missed something. It tends to rely on extrinsic motivators. Did you get a gold star, right? Did you get likes on your Instagram post? Did you get a raise? Did you get a promotion, right? We're always looking outside for validation. The problem with that is that it blinds us to what's actually happening internally. Play is where we find the things that are intrinsically motivational to us. The way that you play is different than the way that I play is the different the way that he plays. The stuff that we're going to enjoy the most. So through play we find what's personally relevant to our motivation. And this is a huge one. In physical practice, people get motivated to lose 20 pounds. Nobody's motivated to continue the very few people find the motivation to continue the lifestyle that keeps them 20 pounds lighter for the rest of their life. They're motivated to run one marathon and then they stop, okay? 
So you need motivations that are sustainable throughout your life. So you need to find those things that are intrinsically engaging. Play. I hesitate to even have the word play in my brand name because as we think of play as frivolous, as silly, as childish, or when we think of adult play, we just think about sex and drugs and alcohol, right? But play is actually the most, one of the most profound learning methods. Great scientists, great athletes, great discoverers, they all talk about what they're doing as play, right? They play with the ideas. They play, they tinker with the machine. It's the most profound form of education. You take something that's motivating to you and then you try a behavior and you vary the behavior until you find something that works. That's the most profound process. We solve problems with it. It's inherently rewarding and it reveals stuff to us. Right? It reveals what is relevant. Again, relevance, realization. Movement. I th we talked about this already. When we go to school and we go to PE and we're forced to do activities that we hate, we think movement is not fun anymore. When we compete in sports that we're not successful in, we feel disempowered. When we're forced to do the same types of activities that we don't like all the time or feel like we have to go to the gym in order to look the right way, it's a trap, right? And then when we fail to succeed at this, we don't feel confident or competent. So what we're looking for is to reconnect people to movement that is fun, that is empowering, that is freeing, that builds confidence, that builds competence. Body, right? Again, going back to this. What, what, what is the value of your body? Is it the things that it allows you to experience in the world or is it the way it's perceived by other people? So often in our culture, we end up seeing it this way. And then a lot of times, even if you know, we're, we're looking at our body as insufficiently attractive or it's in pain all the time. It's not allowing us to do the things that we need. Um, so we want a positive experience of our body. We want our body, our experience, we want our perception of our body to be motivated by the experiences that we can have with it. And we want to actually be tuned into our body. So often in our culture, we're alienated from our bodies just because we're sitting at a computer, just because we're staring at our smartphones, right? It's like, what, people don't, ask somebody, someone's like, I'm mad. Like, well, what does that feel like in your body? I don't know, right? I don't know. Nature, right? How many of you guys have heard like, uh, Shinrin Yu? Shinrin Yoku. Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing. Lots of people know this idea that it's really valuable to be in nature. Last year at our seminar, Daniel Eisenman said something to me. He said that going to this, going to train with me was like having walked on a beach and going surfing for the first time, but for the rest of the world. <laughs> it's like going to the beach and having been to the beach for a walk and then going surfing for the first time, but for the rest of the world. So the, the idea here is when, it, when we experience something, when we realize something, when we make it real, what we're looking for is information and relationship on multiple levels, right? So looking at a picture of a hamburger is not the same as holding it in your hands and smelling it. It's not the same as eating it. It's not the same as making it, right? At each level, you're getting more information, you're getting more relationship with it. The thing becomes more real to you. In the same way, looking at a picture of a tree is not the same as being in front of that tree, is not the same as moving in that tree. And when you take on a practice of moving in the tree, you're actually creating this, this relationship with the tree, which reveals the tree to you. You know what the bark feels like, you know the distances, you know all these things about the tree that become relevant to you, but also it teaches you about yourself. And that's, it's literally like falling in love, right? Falling in love is mutual rev, uh, revelation. You get to fall in love with nature through the uh, practice. And then tribe, right? People are desperate to feel deeply connected to other people. But how do we get, gain connection with other people? We, we, we do it through shared struggle, shared joy, and share, uh, shared re realization. Doing things that, that reveal to me who he really is as a person. What is his process for overcoming fear? And what is my process for overcoming fear? How can I support him? Right? You feel really deeply connected to other people at this retreat by the end of it because you've shared intensely meaningful experiences for seven days. And we don't have enough experiences of that in our culture anymore. So this is the benefits as we see it. And then we get you there. Basically, you know, we talk about natural parkour, dynamic games, uh, rough housing.
But I've kind of started to break it down like this. I like this. You could say there's mindfulness practices, body practices, body to environment practices, body to body practices, and then crafts or skills, right? So mindfulness, meditation, contemplation, body, embodiment kind of fits under the both, but the joint health work, right? Taking care of the body. Something like bodybuilding is a body practice, right? It can be really healthy for you if you need to build up your body. Um, parkour obviously is for us the best body environment practice, but you can see that obviously track or gymnastics are also in the same er arena. Body, body, all the martial arts, the roughhousing, contact improvisation, partner dance, but also working together, making things together. And then, so we can look at, at movement as, as the expression because it's for itself. And then we can look at movement that gives us access to things, the ability to do things. So when I'm playing this with him, it's like I'm learning hand-eye coordination. It's fun, it's rewarding, it's cool, but what's the output at the end of it? There's no output. But if we make a couch together, that's that level. So for us, this is where we've specialized, right? We're in the body and movement arena primarily. We touch on the mindfulness, and through Kyle, we're gonna be touching on craft in wilderness skills, in making fire. And then this part, we're not gonna to talk too much about, but this is basically, how do we teach you the skills? We use an ecological dynamics model, which is that idea that, that we learn through, through tasks, right? We learn through what the environment teaches us. Um, we try to get you guys to learn things, not just by telling them to you, but by getting you, you to do them and experiencing them. That's one of the reasons why we would get you to dialogue. Um, we try to uh, use constraints in the environment to teach you rather than just controlling it with our words. And then uh, this is kind of our, our general trend of how we move across this. We want you to explore a parameter, like explore a, a problem space. Then we try to start extracting out principles of how you move well in that problem space, right? So if you think about chess, it's like, well, play the game a little bit, start figuring out control the center of board, and then you can think about, here's a sequence of moves, like a blitzkrieg, that allows me to, to win, right? Same thing. Play in the tree, cool. Now, what makes it feel good? What gives you good movement? Now, here's some specific tools that will allow you to accomplish that. Then we integrate that into flows, right? Do multiple things together, and then last, we challenge you guys to engage in aliveness, that highest complexity, that freeform reactive movement. So this is essentially what we're gonna be trying to do over the course of this week. We're trying to do our little piece, and it's just a small piece, of helping you guys overcome the meaning crisis through becoming the most heroic version of yourself or cultivating your character through reconnecting to these things through these types of physical practices. Everyone make sense to everybody? Cool. Any questions, any comments, anything people wanna share about that? about the tribe shared experience thing. I was in like sixth grade, I hated this kid. <laughs> we got in a fight and we were best friends afterwards. Oh yeah, that's real common. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's like, oh man, we Knuckle have this, it out. we're part of each other's story now. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I made a lot of my friends in school by punching people. <laughs> it's like, you seem like a big strong guy. I'm gonna punch you in the face. See what happens. Oh, you can take it. I can take it too, we're gonna be friends. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that something that's coming up for me is like we're willing to do this imperfectly, right? That yeah. we're, we as facilitators are also going to struggle and going to fail and we're going to try and offer things that might not work or you might get something totally unplanned or unexpected. Um, so I just want to put that out there. That Embrace the suck. Uh, Jordan? Embrace the suck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a Jordan Peterson quote. Um, is it important enough to you to do poorly? Yeah. Right? If you really, really care about it, you'll be willing to try hard enough to fail. <laughs> willing to go at it when you're not ready. Make sense? Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna play a little bit with some aliveness. So uh, grab a drink of water, jump, run to the bathroom if you need it. Join me here in five minutes and we'll get started. It's getting dry too. I know, it's beautiful. Can I take a picture of that? Yeah.
Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.